Hi class and welcome to the final chapter of the semester. Uh, we're going to end with the digestive system because it's a pretty lengthy chapter. Again, I'll go through and kind of highlight what you should know. Um, so this will be the final chapter that you guys will be expected to know for uh, this module, this uh, exam. So the digestive system <clears throat> is where we will kind of start and where we will end the semester. Uh, from food, humans must get basic organic molecules to make ATP, build tissues, and serve as cofactors and coenzymes. So what digestion does is it breaks down polymers, which could be a carbohydrate, a fat, or a protein, into a monomer, so like a one-piece building block via hydrolysis reactions. And absorption will take these monomers then into the bloodstream to be used by cells. So this is how we kind of can break down through hydrolysis, uh, different uh, either disaccharides or peptides or fats. Through hydrolysis, we can break down um, these food particles into simple monomer components, such as one glucose, one amino acid, one fatty acid, one glycerol. And it's these monomers, one single component that can be easily absorbed in the digestive tract. It's open at both ends and it's continuous with the environment. It's considered outside of the body because it can be entered and exit, exited externally. Materials that cannot be digested, such as cellulose, which is a plant-based material, never actually enter the body. They just travel through the tract. It's a one-way transport, which allows for specialization of function along the tract. Motility is the movement of food through the GI tract. Ingestion is taking the food into the mouth. Mastication is chewing and mixing it with saliva. Uh, de deglutination and swallowing. Peristalsis are the wave-like one-way movement uh, contractions through the tract in the esophagus, stomach, and small intestine. And then segmentation is the churning and mixing while moving forward in the small and large intestine. The secretion uh, can be exocrine or endocrine. Exocrine secretion in the GI tract is the digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid, mucus, water, and bicarbonate. Endocrine secretions are the, are the hormones that help regulate digestion. Digestion specifically means breaking the food down into smaller units, both physically and chemically. And absorption is passing these broken down food into the blood or lymph. The storage and elimination functions are the temporary storage and subsequent elimination of undigested food molecules. And the immune barrier um, is a simple columnar epithelium with tight junctions that will prevent swallowed pathogens from entering the body. And we have different immune cells in the connective tissue surrounding the GI tract to help promote immune responses. Um, so here's the GI tract and what makes up it. It's 30 feet long from the mouth to the anus. And again, it's one continuous tube. Uh, the accessory organs are not within the tube. They're your teeth, tongue, salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Many of these secrete enzymes or other digestive enzymes to help uh, break down the food particles. So here's a look at the GI tract organs and then the accessory organs. Again, the GI tract organs are all continuous in a tube and the accessory organs will just secrete their enzymes or substances into that tube. This should be a review from anatomy. You should know, understand well um, the gross anatomy and parts of the digestive system. Uh, there's four tunics or layers to the GI tract, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa. Each have a purpose, whether that's to increase surface area, pick up nutrients, have their um, arteries and veins in them, or be the smooth muscle part. So here's a look at the four kind of GI tract layers. The smooth muscle layers will help with the peristalsis or mixing. The parasympathetic division regulation of the GI tract, remember your parasympathetic is the rest or digest division. So this will stimulate your esophagus, stomach, small intestine, pancreas, gallbladder, and the first part of the large intestine by your vagus nerve. You have spinal nerves in the sacral region that stimulate the lower large intestine and the preganglionic neurons will synapse on the submucosal and myenteric plexuses. So the GI tract is under parasympathetic division regulation. The sympathetic division will do anything that an inhibits digestion. So inhibiting peristalsis and secretion of those enzyme, it'll stimulate contraction of sphincters, meaning those sphincters will close so that food does not pass through them. 
And you have hormones from the brain or other digestive organs that to help regulate uh, the GI tract too. Intrinsic regulation has to do with sensory neurons in the gut wall uh, that help to intrinsically regulate. Um, and the example of these are paracrine signals. So from your mouth to your stomach, um, <clears throat> you begin with mastication, which is chewing of the food, mixing it for swallowing, mixing it with saliva. Saliva will contain mucus, an antimicrobial agent, and also um, amylase, which is an enzyme that starts the digestion of starches. Deglutination is the coordinated contraction of swallowing. It includes 25 pairs of muscles. There's three parts to it in the oral cavity, the pharyngeal, the pharynx, the throat area, which I'll let you guys read through on your own. Um, and then the esophageal component where the bolus is moved down the esophagus to your stomach via this peristalsis-like movement. And peristalsis is kind of like squeezing a go-gurt tube. Um, the peristaltic wave um, kind of squeezes the bolus down to your stomach. And for the food to get through your esophagus, it usually takes about six to eight seconds when you swallow before it gets to your stomach. So your stomach is about 10 inches long. Um, it's lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous. Um, the lower esophageal sphincter will open to allow food to pass into the stomach and it will stay closed to prevent any regurgitation. Barrett's esophagus infects about 5%. It occurs when part of the normal um, epithelium is replaced by columnar epithelium, uh, which is normal in your stomach and intestine, but it's abnormal in the esophagus. And so it constitutes a metaplastic tissue. And metaplasia refers to the abnormal replacement of cell types. Uh, this usually occurs due to injury of the esophageal mucosa by GERD, which is a reflux disease. Um, it also increases the risk of esophageal adenocarcinopho, which is just cancer of the esophagus. Your stomach then stores food, churns food to mix with gastric secretions, begins protein digestion, it kills bacteria in a very acidic environment, and it will move food into the small intestine in the form of what we call chyme. Here are the regions of the stomach, which should be a review from anatomy. Uh, the lining of your stomach has folds called the rugae, so here again, the region and structure of the stomach, take a good look at this. You should know all the regions and structures of the stomach. These gastric folds or gastric rugae just help to increase surface area and digestion within the stomach wall. Uh, gastric pits at the base of these folds will lead to gastric glands that will contain different types of secretory cells. Mucus neck cells, which secrete mucus to kind of help protect your stomach lining from the very acidic environment. Parietal cells secrete HCL, hydrochloric acid, and intrinsic factor, which helps your small intestine to absorb vitamin B12, which is important. And then you have chief cells, which secrete pepsinogen, which is the inactive form of a protein digesting enzyme. Um, more stomach structure and cells that secrete different um, hormones or paracrine symbols, signals. Uh, it also secretes the hormone ghrelin that signals the brain to regulate hunger. So these are the gastric pits within those stomach folds and you can see how some are chief cells, some are parietal cells, and some are mucus cells. I want you to know what each, the mucus cell, parietal cell, and chief cell, what they each uh, secrete. Parietal cells secrete HCL, chief cells secrete pepsinogen. Uh, in order to form HCL, we have kind of this um, primary active transport facilitated diffusion of chloride. Um, and I'll let, we don't need to know the complete formation of HCL, but I just want you to know um, that these parietal cells are what will secrete this uh, kind of gastric acid, hydrochloric acid. Pepsin and hydrochloric acid secretion. Um, gastrin is made in G cells. It's carried to parietal cells in the blood and it stimulates these ECL cells to make histamine. Um, again, you don't need to know all of this, but I want you to know um, that your chief cells will be creating pepsinogen. Um, pepsinogen will be converted to pepsin, which is the active form that will help to digest proteins. Um, the function of pepsin is that it catalyzes the hydrolysis of peptide bonds in the ingested protein. So it means that so pepsinogen, which is secreted by your chief cells, will be converted to pepsin. And pepsin is important for digesting and breaking apart your proteins. So this is just shows how your chief cells create pepsinogen. 
and then it will get, be converted into pepsin, which takes a big long protein and breaks it apart into shorter peptide chains. Stomach defenses, acid and pepsin could damage the stomach lining because they're extremely acidic. So you have this layer of mucus with alkaline bicarbonate to try to counteract that acidity. There's also tight junctions between epithelial cells to try not to get the acid to leak through. Um, and you have rapid epithelial mitosis, so a rapid division of cells in the stomach wall that replaces the epithelium every three days. So protein digestion begins in the stomach. Starches begin digestion in the mouth. Um, but this, but salivary, salivary amylase, which is from your saliva, is inactive at a really low pH. So this activity actually stops in the stomach. And alcohol and NSAIDs like aspirin are the only common substances absorbed in the stomach uh, due to their high lipid solubility. Um, protein, more digestion. This is kind of the same thing. Um, it's having to do with a pepsin and HCL secretion. A peptic ulcer is any erosion of the mucosa lining of the stomach or the duodenum um, produced by hydrochloric acid. Helio Helicobacteria pylori is a bacterium that reduces mucosal barriers to the acid. And treatment for ulcers usually combines a pump um, inhibitor and an antibiotic, and that's what Prilosec is. Acute gastritis is an inflammation of the submucosa layer caused by acid. Histamine will be released that will stimulate more acid release. Uh, prostaglandins are needed to stimulate, stimulate the pro protective alkaline mucus production. And NSAIDs could also inhibit prostaglandin activity and can lead to gastritis. Tagamet and Zantac are two drugs that inhibit um, these hydrogen receptors to try to um, keep out that inflammation layer. A dual adenal ulcer is an ulcer um, in the duodenum. Um, it's protected by an adherent layer of mucus, bicarbonate is secreted by Brunner's glands, but acidic and the acidic chyme is usually neutralized by these bicarbonate from the pancreas. Um, Zollinger Ellison syndrome are ulcers due to a high amount of gastrin produced usually by a tumor. Uh, weight loss surgery, usually um, in obese people or people who are prone to insulin resistance, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Um, we have a gastric bypass procedure that creates a small pouch in the fundus region to which the mid jejunum is attached. A vertical sleeve gastrectomy is about is about 85% of the stomach will be removed, but the intestinal pathway will be unaltered. Um, so we kind of bypass the stomach. You're in either way, what these two surgeries are doing are trying to just create the stomach to be smaller. Um, they produce long-term weight loss, reduced insulin resistance, improved blood glucose levels, and better insulin secretion within a few days after the surgery. Evidence suggests that increased activity of GLP-1, an intestinal hormone, which stimulates insulin secretion and alterations in uh, the microbiome in the intestines also promotes weight loss and reduce insulin resistance. GERD is this gastroesophageal reflux disorder. It's when um, you get your acidic gastric chyme um, kind of refluxing back up the esophagus, producing heartburn, cough, sore throat. This can produce an esophageal stricture, Barrett's esophagus, or even cancer of the esophagus. Some risk factors include obesity, pregnancy, hiatal hernia, which is an upward protrusion of the stomach through the diaphragm. It's also treated by hydrogen receptor blockers and proton pump inhibitors. So moving into the small intestine, there's three sections of it. Starts at your pyloric sphincter, ends at the ileocecal valve. You should know these three sections. Um, the mucosa and submucosa layers are folded into plicae circularis layers throughout the small intestine. And you can see these plicae circularis layers uh, with villi sticking up. Um, and you can, again, you should know the general anatomy of all these structures as well. The function of your small intestine is to complete the digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And also this is the, where the majority of your nutrients are absorbed, which many are listed here. Um, that you can see there. It's a very rapid absorption due to the villi and microvilli, so all of these different um, kind of outpockings with pieces sticking out that help with absorption. 
So this is what a villi is. Um, it's lined with columnar epithelium with goblet cells. It has capillaries in them, which um, absorb monosaccharides, amino acids, lacteals will absorb the fats. You have intestinal crypts with panic cells to help secrete any antibi and antibacterial mo molecules and mitotic stem cells that will rapidly divide to re replenish your intestinal cells every four to five days. The microvilli is the brush border. It's the folding of the apical surface of each epithelial cell, again, to try to create as much surface area um, to try to trap anything that's being digested and help to absorb it. So here's the lacteal absorbing fats, the capillaries absorbing everything else, um, all within one single villus. Um, intestinal enzymes are called the brush border enzymes. They're not released into the lumen. They stay attached to the plasma membrane with an active site exposed to chyme and they'll help break apart disaccharides, polypeptides and other substrates to simple nutrient molecules. So these are just um, brush border enzymes that help to break apart um, everything that needs to be digested. Here's a look at the category of um, kind of structure and the enzyme needed to break it apart and any kind of comments and description next to it that you can read through. Lactose intolerance, it's a condition with greatest prevalence actually among those with African, Asian, Hispanic and Native American heritage. And this just refers to the inability to digest the disaccharide lactose um, and galactose for absorption by the small intestine. Um, accumulation of lactose in the intestine will produce symptoms like abdominal gas, bloating, diarrhea, and nausea. Um, most people with lactose intolerance can produce lactase when they are babies and young children, but will gradually lose this ability with um, age. Um, intestinal contractions and motility. Peristalsis is weak in the intestines. Movement of food is much slower due to pressure at the pyloric end. Uh, segmentation will be stronger and serves to mix the chyme and smooth muscle contractions will occur automatically um, to kind of squeeze or push the chyme along. So here's a look at segmentation in the small intestine. It mixes things and then kind of pushes it forward. So that's what segmentation is. It mixes, pushes it forward, mixes, pushes it back. Whereas peristalsis kind of had this squeezing like motion and that occurred in the esophagus. Um, more intestinal contractions and motility. I'll kind of skip over this. Um, basically this, these um, kind of voltage gated calcium channels are what will produce the action potentials to produce the contractions needed for the segmentation which gives these kind of slow wave like action potentials um, to squeeze or kind of segment, mix the food along. Regulation of contraction, it's under autonomic nerves, which will influence um, the system to stimulate or inhibit these cells. Um, and acetylcholine is released from the parasympathetic system to do that. Okay, the large intestine then, these are the regions through the large intestine, take some time to kind of review the large intestine anatomy that is all seen here, um, kind of up through the ascending over the transverse descending. A haustrum or a haustra is a segment. And the tenier collier, which is not labeled in this picture, is this kind of um, smooth muscle line that helps to project things along. The appendix is seen there, no known use for it, but if it gets inflamed or burst, it could be really scary and dangerous. The sigmoid is the S-shaped part before the rectum and the anal canal. So the mucosa here is described on the outer surface of the large intestine forms these pouches called the haustra. The large intestine functions are mainly to absorb your water, electrolytes, vitamin K, and some vitamin B. Um, the production of vitamin K and B vitamins are via microbial organisms and also a big function is just to store the feces. You have many intestinal microbes um, called microflora. Um, these bacteria are mostly anaerobic. Um, this bacteria just helps to keep us unharmed um, from all the waste that's passing through us. And an infant will receive its initial colonization of bacteria from its mother during birth. Here's more benefits from microbes um, that are important in the kind of the large intestine that I'll help you read through. 
If we have a disruption of this normal microflora, this bacteria can lead to inflammatory bowel disease, which is very painful. Um, more benefits from microbes, protection from other intestinal bacteria. Um, I won't let you have you guys learn too much about other intestinal microbiota, uh, the bacteria that just keeps us safe. So here's appendicitis. It's inflammation of your appendix. It does not function in digestion, but it contains nodules and a population of bacteria that helps to replenish a normal intestinal microbiota. Um, appendicitis is a medical emergency that produces is pain in the lower right abdominal quadrant, nausea and other symptoms. A burst appendix could spread the inflammation to the surrounding peritoneal membranes, a condition called peritonitis, and that can produce circulatory shock and death. And this can be prevented by an appendectomy, which is the surgical removal of your appendix. Fluid and electrolyte absorption. Um, most absorption occurs in the small intestine, but some is left for the large intestine. Not all water is absorbed. About 200 milliliters is left per day to be excreted with feces. And water is absorbed passively um, following an gradient set up by sodium potassium pumps. Um, some minor secretion of water occurs by osmosis. Uh, diarrhea is the excretion of excessive fluid. It's usually due to a virus like the stomach flu. Certain bacteria produce secretory diarrhea by releasing what we call enterotoxin. Other bacteria can produce an inflammatory diarrhea by invading the mucosa, causing damage and inflammation. Um, the largest concern in the medical community with diarrhea is just dehydration because you're losing too many fluids too quickly. Defecation is then the medically correct term for passing the feces out of the body. Uh, the internal anal sphincter will relax and the need to defecate will rise and then the external anal sphincter will control the defecation voluntarily. Inflammatory bowel disease includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, genes can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease which could involve an altered immune response. There will be decreased mucus secretion and changes in tight junctions that increase intestinal permeability and these can lead to erosions and ulcerations in the intestinal mucosal lining wall, it can be very extremely painful. Crohn's disease is characterized by inflammation. It can cause fibrosis, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fatigue, weight loss. Um, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease has been rising and could be promoted by poor diet, overuse of antibiotics, which can cause a change in the intestinal microbiota that provoke an immune response against the changed bacterial population. Irritable bowel syndrome is caused by complex factors that affect the neural regulation of your GI tract. Again, produces pain, diarrhea, constipation. Alterations of your intestinal microbiota have been proposed as a root cause. For example, defective interactions of the intestinal microbiota with the enteric nervous system and with the brain are believed to contribute to this irritable bowel syndrome. So then we'll get into some of the accessory organs, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas. Uh, this takes us through the liver. Um, it's immediately beneath the diaphragm and has amazing regenerative abilities due to mitosis of its liver cells, hepatocytes. Um, it's composed of hepatocytes that form hepatic plates separated by capillaries called sinusoids, um, which these capillaries are extremely permeable and they allow for the passage of blood proteins, fat, and cholesterol. Cuffer cells are also in the sinusoids and hepatic damage due to alcohol or viral hepatitis will cause liver fibrosis um, that can lead to cirrhosis or scarring of the liver tissue. So this is a look at a microscopic structure of the liver. You can see this portal triad is made up of a hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery, bile canaliculi and bile ductile. So your liver functions to help um, detoxify the blood as well as create bile to help digest fats. The hepatic portal system, uh, products of digestion are absorbed in your intestines and delivered to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. The veins from the pancreas, gallbladder, stomach, um, omentum, and spleen also join the hepatic portal vein. And after circulating through the liver capillaries, the blood will leave via the hepatic vein to join regular venous circulation. So the hepatic portal system will clean out anything digested and absorbed in your intestines goes to the liver first to kind of be cleaned out and sorted through. 
The portal system is a unique pattern of capillaries that leads to veins, which leads to more capillaries and other veins. Total hepatic blood flow is about 25% of cardiac output, and it's needed to maintain hepatic clearance. These are the liver lobules um, made up of arteries, veins, and a central vein. Um, bile is secreted by hepatocytes. It's released into bile canaliculi, which drains into bile ducts and to hepatic ducts away from the liver. Um, so here is the kind of the branch of the hepatic vein and hepatic artery. And again, um, you can see the sinusoids there as well. The bile ductile is what will create the bile. Um, and the bile canaliculus will carry the bile to the bile ductile and out the liver. And the sinusoids um, will all drain um, anything that has been absorbed from the blood supply from um, the digestive tract into the central vein. Enterohepatic circulation aside from bile, the liver secretes other substances into the bile ducts to clear them from the blood. Some of the molecules released into the bile are absorbed again in the small intestine and returned to the liver. And these molecules are part of what we call enterohepatic circulation and eventually molecules will be excreted in the feces. So this just shows kind of the general circulation of things that travel through the liver back, liver, back into the bile through the small intestine and picked back up into the liver again. Compounds excreted by the liver into the bile, um, bile salts, um, bilirubin, um, some of these you don't really need to know. The bile salts are the big one because bile salts will help to um, uh, digest fats. Major categories of liver function, the detoxification of blood, carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism, um, protein synthesis, and secretion of bile. So these major functions and major categories of liver function, I do want you to know this is probably a good chart to just take a minute to review uh, those major liver functions, which we're kind of going to go through now. Bile production and secretion are a big one of liver function. Bile is composed of these substances seen here. Bilirubin is produced in the spleen, liver, and bone marrow. Um, first of all, what bile does, if we don't get it to later, bile is what will digest your fats in your small intestine. Bilirubin is not water soluble. Um, it is produced in the spleen, liver, and bone marrow, and it's derived from heme minus the iron from hemoglobin. So it's kind of a breakdown product um, of hemoglobin. Bilirubin is secreted also into the bile where it's taken into the small intestine um, and it will be absorbed by the intestines to take in back into the liver. So here's a look at the pathway um, of met met the metabolism of heme and bilirubin. Oops. Enterocirculation just again shows you of urobilirubin, which um, is eventually gets taken out of the urine. You guys don't need to know this though. Bile salts are made from bile acids, which are deprived from cholesterol. Um, but bile salts are important for forming missiles or um, kind of the surrounding area um, around a fat molecule. Fat will enter this missile structure and will be emulsified or broken down. And it provides a greater surface area for fat digestion by the enzyme lipase. So that's what bile and bile salts are important for. And this is a missile of bile acids um, which will form around a fat molecule to help digest it. The liver also removes hormones, drugs, and other substances by either excreting them into bile, phagocytizing them by cuffer cells in the sinusoids, or chemically, they're then being chemically altered by hepatocytes. So we kind of have this detoxification of all blood going through the liver too. Secretion of glucose, triglycerides, and ketone bodies. The liver is very important in helping balance blood glucose levels by removing glucose and storing it as glycogen and triglycerides, or by breaking down glycogen and releasing it back into the blood. The liver can also make glucose from amino acids and convert fatty acids into ketones. Production of plasma proteins. So the liver is important in creating different types of plasma proteins. Um, which are listed here. So those are different types of plasma proteins that the liver helps make. Cirrhosis occurs when liver portal lobules will be destroyed and replaced by fibrotic scar tissue uh, that lack normal plate-like structure. This tissue cannot adequately remove bilirubin and other toxic molecules. So it causes jaundice and ill effects in many organs like the brain. 
disrupted blood flow through the liver sinusoids will cause portal hypertension, which means high pressure in the portal vein. The most common cause of cirrhosis are hepatitis B and C virus, alcoholism and non-alcoholic um, steatohepitis. Alcoholics with cirrhosis who stop drinking right away have a 65% chance of surviving three years, uh, but have no chance if they do not stop drinking. Um, so alcoholism is another one of my soapbox topics. So just be careful how much you drink. You only get one liver. Um, you just want to take care of it. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is usually associated with obesity and insulin resistance. Um, it appears to be promoted by diets high in saturated fat. It's benign unless it develops into what we call um, NASH, an inflammatory condition that can promote cirrhosis, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. So basically, eat healthy, don't smoke, don't drink, um, and your liver will thank you, as well as the rest of your body. Alcoholic fatty liver disease can occur in people who are moderate heavy drinkers. Um, and this just goes you through how alcoholic fatty liver disease can potentially grow into a fatal condition as the increased risk of esophageal cancer in alcoholics. Jaundice is a yellow staining of the sclera of the eye, mucous membranes, and skin caused by elevated levels of blood bilirubin. This condition may result from prehepatitis hepatic, hepatic, or post-hepatic causes. Um, it ref the prehepatic jaundice refers to an increase in free bilirubin due to increased hemolysis of red blood cells, which provides more heme groups for conversion into bilirubin. Hepatic jaundice can raise either free or conjugated bilirubin, and post-hepatic jaundice is usually due to a blockage in the drainage of bile. Um, because bilirubin cannot be excreted, it will rise in the blood and this obstruction may result from a gallstone, pancreatic disease, or stricture of the bile duct. Here's the gallbladder. It's a sac-like organ attached to the inferior surface of the liver. It stores and concentrates bile from the liver. So liver travels um, through the bile ducts, into the hepatic duct, into the cystic duct, into the gallbladder. And then from the gallbladder, bile will travel through the cystic duct, through the common bile duct, into the duodenum. So here's a great look at how um, bile travels from the gallbladder into the duodenum and the different duct system that it travels through. Um, knowing this kind of, this anatomy of the liver, gallbladder, and how they enter and what all these ducts are called is important to know as well. Gallstones are hard mineral deposits that form in the gallbladder and generally have cholesterol as their major component. Um, they're produced when the liver secretes enough cholesterol to create a super saturated solution and crystals. Sometimes more sizable gallstones can be produced that block uh, ducts and evoke extreme pain and nausea of biliary colic. So here's a look at a gallbladder filled with gallstones. Isn't that crazy? The pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions. Endocrine, um, is the hormone function, the islets of Langerhans cells make insulin, which decreases blood glucose levels, and glucagon, which increases blood glucose levels. And the exocrine function of the pancreas is due to the acinar cells make, making pancreatic juice that's delivered to the duodenum via the pancreatic duct uh, to help with digestive enzyme process. So here are the acinar cells creating um, the digestive enzymes. And here are the pancreatic islet cells um, in the clearer portion or the lighter portion, light pink, um, secreting the hormones, insulin and glucagon. So here's the pancreatic juice. It's made of a bicarbonate and 20 different digestive enzymes. It takes you through the action of all those enzymes. You don't need to know the action of each. You just need to know that this pancreatic juice has a lot of enzymes that help with digestion. Bicarbonate formation is made by cells lining the ductiles. Um, made from CO2 from the blood. Um, people with cystic fibrosis have trouble secreting bicarbonate because of a defective chloride carriers, which could lead to destruction of the pancreas. Here's the formation of bicarbonate. Um, it's formed from CO2 in the blood. Other than that, you don't need to know any more details. Pancreatic enzymes, most will be inactive, which we call zymogenes until they reach the small intestine. And once they reach the small intestine, they will be um, activated. 
activation of pancreatic enzymes, um, showing trypsin as an example, activating cymogens to active enzymes. Pancreatitis is inflammation of your pancreas, acute or chronic. It's usually caused by gallstones or some drugs. Um, chronic pancreatitis is usually due to chronic alcohol abuse. Um, symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting diagnosis. Um, in pancreatitis, pancreatic enzymes can also become abnormally activated in the pancreas and also damage tissue. So we'll kind of end here. Let me see how far this is an extremely long PowerPoint. Digest regulation of your digestive system. We'll go over this a little bit with hormones and then we'll kind of finish up here, digestion and absorption of food. So we're getting there. I know this is a long one. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, we'll kind of squim through these ones pretty quickly. Um, you have neural and endocrine control of di the digestive systems, which will modify your GI tract, sight, smell, taste, and thought of food can also stimulate salivation or gastric secretions. Stimulation goes from your brain to the organ via the vagus nerve, um, except if it's a short reflex, it will not involve the brain. Um, GI tract produces some of these hormones as the tardic for the action. So here are some of the hormones produced and secreted by parts of the GI tract and their effects. Motility and secretion are somewhat autom automatic, um, depending on if there's food in the tract. Three phases of, ex of extrinsic gastric regulation. I'm, you guys don't need to know that. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over these cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases. You don't need to know that. Your enteric nervous system are the neurons and glial cells that innervate the intestines. Um, they're in, they're, they act independently from your central nervous system, but with some feedback via the vagus nerve. So this is your enteric nervous system, pericon regulation, um, intestinal reflexes. Uh, two hormones will be produced when chyme enters the duodenum, secretin and choleocystokinin, CCK. So those are two hormones that will be produced that help to regulate um, digestion in the small intestine, the duodenum. Secretion of pancreatic juice um, is under um, hormones control as well. The liver produces bile continuously, continuously, but the arrival of food into the duodenum will stimulate increased production of bile. So that happens when more home hormones are produced. Um, the GI hormones have a tropic effect for the maintenance of their target hormones. Structure of the gastric mucosa is dependent on gastrin and the structure of the acinar cells on the pancreas depends on CCK. So what this means is that specific hormones will have an effect on their target organ, organs and the cells that will secrete the necessary um, substances and enzymes needed for digestion. Most carbohydrates are ingested as starch or sugars, um, such as sucrose or lactose, and then these will be broken down in um, the stomach and small intestine. And this just shows the action of pancreatic amylase, how it breaks apart a long starch molecule into its monomer or shorter um, disaccharide molecules. Absorption of carbohydrates, they're absorbed across epithelium via secondary transport with sodium. Um, digestion of proteins begins in your stomach with pepsin and hydrochloric acid to produce short chain polypeptides. And then it's finished in the small intestine. The final products of proteins are amino acids, which are eventually absorbed um, into the small intestine. And this just shows how a long protein polypeptide chain is broken apart into its components, which are absorbed into an epithelial cell, and eventually its components will be absorbed into capillary blood. That digestion begins in the duodenum when bile will emulsify the fat and the pancreatic enzyme lipase will break it down into glycerol and fatty acid. So here's a triglyceride of fat and its components that it gets broken down into. Fat emulsification and digestion, here is showing the fat droplets from your stomach and how um, from the liver and gallbladder comes the biles, which will emulsify the fat droplets to help make it easier for lipase to break them down. Absorption of fats will move into bile missiles and transport it to the brush border. Um, inside um, the, the, um, the chylomicrons secreted by exocytosis 
will be what would the central lacteal of the villus picks up. So remember this lacteal, um, this is the structure that will carry um, all the fats absorbed to the thoracic duct. So the lacteals help absorb fats. Transports of lipid into the blood, the lymphatic system will drop these chylomicron fat droplets into the bloodstream at the thoracic duct. And that's how we get the lipids into the blood. And they can be HDL or LDL or very low density lipoproteins um, and low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins are just different types of cholesterol. Um, HDL particles will bind to receptors in the blood vessel walls and capture phospholipids and free cholesterol, reducing cholesterol amounts. Once the HDL is full, it travels to the liver and unloads the cholesterol. So here's the lipoprotein class, the origin, the destination, the major lipids in them, and the function of each. The characteristics of major digestive organ, digestive enzymes. This is a good chart to maybe just review, especially looking at salivary amylase, pepsin, pancreatic amylase, different enzymes, the site of the action and where the source is. And the optimal pH means where they, what pH they work at optimum. So for example, the pepsin works at an optimal pH of a very acidic one to two, and that's because it's found in your stomach, which is a very acidic environment. And that will end this chapter. Thanks for listening, guys.